Jacquard, and I am a security architect with Talon. My partner in crime, Tom Szluski, is here. Czesluski, excuse me. So he will be more than happy to answer all of your questions that you might have during the presentation. So with that, I want to welcome all of you and I hope you find it interesting, educational, all of those good things that we came here for, right? Yeah, fantastic. Okay, so let's talk about security. Let's talk about Defender for Cloud that used to be Azure Defender and Security Center. Now it's Defender for Cloud. So we're gonna start off talking about challenges. We all have challenges, right? Everyday life, but security challenges are really what we're here to talk about. We're talking about all of security, but we all know we all have challenges around security. It's visibility, it's compliance, it's how do we know what we don't know, right? All of those things that we face every day in our environments. So one of the things is understanding where all that plays. So control, right? We all want control. As security people, we're usually all control freaks, right? But without security controls in place, policies, products, procedures, all of those things that we consider controls, 68% of breaches take months or longer to discover. So what causes, why are they there so long before we notice? A big factor is time to respond. So as an example, before I came to Talon, there, I had a customer who had a vendor that ran an AV server, but they did not have access to it. And that server did not feed information to their SIM, their security information and event management system. So it generated an event for an exploit. Nobody saw that event at the customer site. And a few months later, it was identified that they were on the network when they saw lateral movement and were picked up by a different product on the network. So again, time to respond, visibility, right? And in 2019, there was a 95% increase in the cost of a breach, according to Ponemon. The average now is about $5.16 million per breach. I don't know about you, but I don't have that kind of money. That's a lot of money. There was also an increase in the number of sophistication of attack. Microsoft inspected, monitored, and controlled over 12 billion cloud activities in 2019. I'm sure, it's way more now, okay? But this thing about the increase in number of sophistication of attacks. I don't disagree that there's a lot of sophistication and a lot of what those bad actors do, and they're pretty smart people. I don't take that away from them at all. But if you didn't see, about three weeks ago, there was an article written about how these sophisticated, smart people are now using one of the oldest tools to attack somebody an infrastructure for ransomware. They're actually using distributed denial of service attacks with packets that say, pay us and we'll quit, basically. But they're using a, a tool that's been around for 40, 50 years. 
So not so sophisticated. It just shows you how resilient they are. Why go through a lot when I can do something that's really easy and get paid? So let's talk about zero trust. So why are we going to talk about zero trust? Well, we all know that IT security is complex. Nobody is going to say it's not. We have many devices, users, connections, servers, all of those things, right? We have all of this architecture. The majority of us are not all in a cloud environment yet. So we have on-prem and we have cloud. So how do we secure all of that? Well, in today's world, identity has become the new border, right? Ah, uh, because we're all mobile. I've worked from home office for 20 years. I haven't sat in a cubicle in an office in over 20 years, okay? And I've been mobile all that time, traveling around the world in hotels, all of that, my office, at home, so is that defense in depth methodology protecting me? You know, all of that stuff we put on prem. Sometimes, sometimes not. So now I have device security, right? We tried this trusted network security. That is defense in depth. We have layers upon layers upon layers of security before we reach the core. We have multiple security products in some instances that do the exact same thing. I know I did it at my last corporate world job where I sat in a cubicle. A third of the gross national product went through this company every day. That's a ton of money. So yes, we did a lot of things. Security through obscurity. We'd buy three different AV products, put one at the gateway, put one on a secured zone inside the network and a different one on all the end devices. Why? Hopes that if it was missed at the gateway, one of the other two different AV products would catch it. That's really complex and it's very expensive. But in trusted networks, most of our methodology in that defense in depth, based on network controls, source IP, desk IP, ports, all of that, it seems seemingly simple and economical, but it really wasn't. We had all these firewalls, we had load balancers, we, we, you know, clustered things. We did all of that, but we always accepted lower security on the inside of the network than we did on the outside. Yeah, that kind of methodology doesn't really work anymore because identity, where is this person, right? I've been all over the world. I was mobile for over 20 years in different countries, right? I had to protect my endpoint. My company had to protect that asset. We had to protect the identity. We had to have controls. But assets increasingly leave the network. We've got bring your own device, mobile, SaaS, right? And attackers have shifted their methodology to identity attacks, right? They want credentials. It's easier if I have creds and I can access something. So phishing's gone up 500 plus percent over the last five years. Security people see that all the time. We see all these phishing. We get our user base sending us, hey, I think this is a phishing email, right? We've got all these controls to identify it. As security people, we're overwhelmed. So how do we fix that? 
how do we get a methodology that works, right? So we use a zero trust model. And we start securing based on zero trust. It is a strategy to increase security assurances. It's not a policy, it's not a product, it's not a device that we install. It's a methodology. We use it for business assets, data, applications, inside, outside our network. And it leads to better user access that is policy driven because we're going to explicitly validate trust of all access requests, whether it's coming from a device, an application, or a user. We're dynamically addressing insufficient trust. We have conditional access policies. We have multi-factor. We have all of these things that we're looking at. It's gonna lead to better security posture. Am I saying defense in depth is not valid? No, it's still valid, but it's just not doing what we had hoped it was gonna do 30 years ago, 40 years ago. It's also gonna lead to modernizing SecOps. Pervasive detection and response. That's what we want. We want to detect when there's insufficient trust, when they fail multi factor authentication. We want to detect when people are trying to get visibility inside and outside our network. What are they doing? Where are they coming from? We want rapid remediation with automation and integrated workflow. And that's what Zero Trust can give us. Looking at the operational technology and the data center, we want to monitor and segment assets by business risk. What is the risk? Did you do a risk assessment? Was it quantitative or qualitative? Now that company I mentioned that I worked for many years ago, we would do risk analysis. We had a server from one of our customers that was worth a million dollars an hour if it went down. That was our SLA, our service level agreement. That's a lot of money to lose. But this is looking at your workloads, your apps, your API, device security, all of those things. Looking at the operational technology, industrial internet of things. Most people don't even realize if you think about your operational technology, how old are your routers and switches? You may have new equipment, but how old is that technology? Believe it or not, 50 plus years. Doesn't really change. So how do we protect that? How do we isolate it? Zero trust is gonna lead to increased security and increased productivity. We're going to be able to secure all of that based on a methodology. It's a framework, right? Zero trust, right? How to build that foundation of trust. It's an architecture model that really institutes a deny until verified approach for access to resources inside and outside the network. This approach actually addresses challenges associated with shifting security perimeter in a cloud-centric and mobile workforce era, right? COVID-19 really brought a lot of this out as far as everybody became mobile. 
a lot of companies didn't even have an infrastructure for people to work from home and they had to build it. The core principle of zero trust is maintaining strict access control, right? It's critical to prevent attackers from actually pivoting laterally and elevating access within an environment. This is really what we want to prevent. Am I saying that you're not going to have somebody get on your network? No. Bad guys are pretty smart. Okay. But it's about making sure they do not have the capability to laterally move, to do a lot of these things that they're, or elevate their credentials. We're trying to lock everything down, right? Now, just how important this is. The federal government on January 27th said that all of their infrastructure must be compliant with zero trust by the end of 2024. That was on January 27th of this year. Anybody who's ever done DOD work knows that two years is a really short time frame for the government to get anything done. I spent four years in the Middle East. I ordered three EMC squared SAN devices for a SIM. Six years after I ordered them, they finally got installed. So two years is really fast. Zero trust is based on three principles. Verify explicitly, always authenticate and authorize based on all data available. What do you know? What can you get? How do you verify that entity? Least privileged access. Limit users with just in time, so they only have access when they need it, and just enough access, right? So if I'm a domain admin, I don't need my domain admin all the time. I don't need that account. But even if I'm a domain admin, there should also be a process that even with that account, I submit a request inside Azure, and then my buddy Tom here approves it just so there's a record of me doing that. And he allows me access for only a specific amount of time. Always assume breach. You want to minimize the blast radius, right? So always assume it's been breached already. We want to prevent lateral movement, segment access for users, networks, devices, apps, all of it, data. When I talk about assume breach, I always tell people, We've always all heard that saying, the only secure computer is the one still in the box and never been plugged into the internet. I don't even believe that. I buy a new computer. I don't know who built it. I don't know what they put on there. So I pull it out of the box and I format the hard drive and I reinstall an operating system because I don't want whatever it is they put on there. So now I assumed that it was breached and I fixed it, right? These are the three principles. Now, looking at the pillars, this is a product map of how Microsoft offers security for all six pillars. Identity, devices, data, apps, infrastructure, and network. Those are the six pillars of zero trust. Now, Talon, at Talon, we say there's actually a seventh pillar, and that is policy. Without policy, I don't know what my CISO wants me to do as the security person. 
I read that policy and say, oh, hey, I get what he wants. Let me go in and secure that environment based on this policy. So you can see for identity, we have Azure Active Directory, Identity Protection, Defender for Identity, Microsoft Defender for Cloud, and Defender for Endpoint for the devices. We also have Intune. So I can see all the inventory. I can see every device for data. Defender for 365, for SQL. Defender for server. Vulnerability assessment is built into it. There's a Qualys scanner built into that agent. So it can continually assess the server. Defender for app services. Defender for cloud, which is going to give me my just in time and just enough registration. Adaptive network hardening, so I can secure the network. Micro segmentation. And you know what? How do I see all this data? How do I correlate it? Make it relevant to me. I could install Microsoft Sentinel. So I could have a SIM source solution that I could write all these different rules that find what I want it to look for based on the logs from all of these systems in a single ecosystem. I don't have to buy anything else. It's all right here. Now, one of the things I always like to point out, because this is something I've experienced and I've had lots of customers experience, frustration. And this maturity model is about where do I start? Now with zero trust, nobody tells you where you have to start on these pillars. Identity and devices are the two largest attack surfaces, but you could start with network, data, apps, it's up to you. But we typically at Talon recommend identity and devices as a starting point. And you want to secure each one before moving on to the next. Now, I'm not saying don't fix gaping holes. I would do that. So, for instance, if I had a storage account that was publicly accessible, I would fix that. But then I'd go back to identity and get all my identity stuff working. Now, back to the maturity model. How long? Will it take me on my journey to secure all the pillars? Okay. Well, that's a great question. So my boss tells me I need to follow zero trust. And I need to secure the environment based on that methodology. But what he doesn't say is, that's the only thing I want you to do. So how long is it going to take me from day one all the way up here? Well, I don't know. I've got 10 other jobs. I can't dedicate my day every day, all day, to working across the policies, the products and making sure everything's done right. I can't do that. I have 10 other jobs. So how long is it going to take me? Two years, three years. But if my boss says the only thing I want you to focus on is this, how long is it going to take me? Six months, maybe a year, because I have to work with other people and have them do stuff and I can't make them do stuff. The point here is don't get frustrated and quit. I've seen a lot of people do that, not just with instituting zero trust, but with products and all of that. Uh, if you've ever done a sim, you know how complex that can be. And you don't have all day, every day to dedicate to it. Same methodology here. Work what you can, when you can, and secure the environment, and hopefully you don't get breached in the meantime, right? That's the hope. That's what we all do. What products can help us? What policies can help us? 
but it's important to understand it's going to take time. And it is a journey. It's not an end state. Because IT changes, right? We all know that. Information technology constantly changes. We're constantly having to adjust things. Okay. So, with that, that's my little soapbox about zero trust and secure methodology. Now, Azure is the only cloud platform built by a security vendor, okay? So, a lot of people think, oh, Microsoft's not a security vendor, you know? I'm a Linux guy, I used to think that way, but that's not Damn true, it. you know? That's not true. They're a huge security vendor. They earn over $10 billion a year in security revenue. Okay. 400,000 customers, 90 of the top Fortune 100 companies use Microsoft security solutions. They employ over 3,700 security experts. I know a few of these guys. I used to work with them in various roles, and they are experts. They spend over a billion dollars annually on security. They have committed to spending over five billion over the next five years on security. In 2020, there were 6 billion malware threats blocked by Defender. I don't know what you consider security, but I consider that a pretty good record. And I actually used to work for one of the largest security vendors in the world. This is really good. The other thing is Microsoft takes in over 8 trillion signals every 24 hours. Like any security company, they have a bunch of people who look at all that information. They analyze that information. They reverse engineer malware. I affectionately call these people propeller heads. I wouldn't want their job. It's not fun to me to do all of that stuff, but I'm glad they do it. And what's really cool is these 8 trillion signals, whatever is considered an indicator of compromise is actually put into a threat intelligence feed that's sent to the Microsoft Defender products so that it can look for those IOCs. Now, AWS and Google Cloud are not security vendors. They have a couple of things they've put in and bought, but they're technically not security vendors. Microsoft is. So looking at a cloud kill chain model, if you've ever been an analyst, you're probably familiar with Lockheed kill chain methodology, most people have at least heard of the MITRE threat matrix. And if you've been an analyst, you've probably heard of the pyramid of pain when it comes to doing analysis. But the kill chain model really is starting with exposure. Anything, whether it's internal or cloud. What's exposed? Insecure configured apps. What vulnerabilities are there that haven't been patched? Maybe they have, but they haven't rebooted. So it's not fully deployed yet. Infected admin devices, accounts, whatever that might be. What they're going to do is utilize these types of techniques to see what they can access. Virtual machines, web apps, phishing to get credentials, brute force attacks, right? 
looking at using rainbow tables and things like that to try and brute force an account. The Internet of Things, looking to see if they can get on your phone. Is your phone hooked up to work? Oh, great, look, I've got a way in now. And then what they're going to do once they get access, depending on the level of access they have, they are going to try to do lateral movement to get where they want to go, to get the information they want. And in the process of doing this lateral movement, they're probably going to try to do credential escalation, elevation, right? I want to escalate my privileges. Mark doesn't have enough privileges to access the SQL database. So let me start sniffing who does. Let me see if I can get better credentials. Sniff the processes that are running on this virtual machine. No intention of letting it go. They're just going to get their money. As soon as you reboot, they're going to destroy all the data. Or do they want the money? They want to sell your information. What do they want to do? Now, looking at Defender for Cloud, trying to protect the environment. It helps strengthen the multi-cloud security posture so we can actually deploy across multi-cloud environments using an agent called ARC. We can actually deploy into AWS, GCP, and we could see the secure score, policies and compliance, automation, all of that on those different platforms. It's truly a hybrid. I can do this on-prem. So whatever policy I'm enforcing in my cloud, I can actually enforce on-prem in multiple different clouds across my IoT devices, databases, all of that. And it looks like it's all in Azure. I can make it exist in Azure. So looking at where Defender for Cloud actually plays. So in this big red block, this big red outline. So Defender for Cloud, as I mentioned, you're going to see the threat intel. That gets fed down from those 8 trillion signals. But it protects my VMs, services, containers, all of those different things that are running in the cloud. We have Azure Policy, so I can enforce policy from Azure Policy, or I can use Defender to do it. Looking at my network security groups, firewalls, advanced threat protection for SQL. What about my storage accounts? If you're using storage accounts in Azure, what protects them? I don't know of a third party product that's going to protect a storage account other than Defender for Cloud. It's the only thing that really sees it. Looking at your on prem. So I've got all these policies I want to enforce across my entire architecture. What of all these devices on-prem? How am I managing those? How am I enforcing policy against all those devices? Simply deploy Azure Arc. And then I can make it look like it exists in the cloud. And I can enforce all my cloud policy against those on-prem resources. All the servers, all the endpoints, all of that. So I can get a single ecosystem look from using ARC and Defender for Cloud and enforcing all my policies. Defender for Cloud is a dashboard driven system. Really, because it's a single dashboard, you're gonna have multiple panes of glass in it. It's a way to help you improve your posture management and threat protection. It strengthens the security posture of your cloud resources. Integrated with Defender plans, Defender for Cloud protects workloads running in Azure, hybrid or other platforms, right? So on-prem, AWS. Defender for Cloud actually provides tools needed to harden your resources, track that security posture, 
protect against attacks and streamline that management. That's what we want, right? We want streamline management. Work smarter, not harder. I don't want to have to go to 15 different consoles to figure out what's going on in my environment. I don't want to have to go to my patch management server to see that a patch hasn't been applied. I can see that in Defender for Cloud. It's going to fill three vital needs. It continuously assesses. Again, it's going to identify and track vulnerabilities. That Qualys scanner is going to tell me what hasn't been applied, the CVE articles that apply to it. It's going to help me harden those, right? I have a policy. It's going to help me look how compliant am I am, am I to that policy? And again, it defends against threats, helps me identify what people are trying to do against my network. So continuous assessment, how to understand your posture. You're going to get a secure score. It's a single score that you can tell at a glance your current security situation. The higher the score, the lower the risk. This score, according to Microsoft, they want you to be at about 70 to 80 percent. I can tell you I haven't seen that in too many different environments that we've done assessments on. Secure Harden all your resources and services. You're going to get recommendations, customized and prioritized hardening tasks to improve your posture. It's going to tell you what you need to do in order to remediate whatever it finds. And in many situations, it's going to give you a fix button. All you have to do is say fix. You don't have to do anything. It's a quick fix. I'd highly recommend you read what it's going to do before you do that. But again, you can just click the button. If there isn't a fix button, then just read what it's telling you to do. It'll walk you through the steps that you need to do to harden that device, that recommendation. And again, it defends. It detects threats. Resources, services, all of that, you're going to get security alerts. Those alerts will tell you why they're generating, what's happening, and you can even feed those to your SIM. Service management, solutions, all of that. So, looking at an example dashboard, so you can see here 73 Azure subscriptions. How many AWS accounts are connected? How many GCP? How many resources did it assess? And there are 209 active recommendations with 7,336 security alerts. You can see insights over here. Most prevalent recommendations. New security alerts. Controls with the highest potential increase. So how many controls, what will they give you if you fix it? Then you can see your secure score. Individual panes that I can drill down on, secure score, workload protections, my regulatory compliance, CMCC, NIST, ISO 27001. We're not doing too well here. Firewall manager, see all my firewalls, all the different policies, the regions, all my inventory, how many assets are unmonitored, how many total resources, and then information protection. This requires you installing Purview so that you can see your resource scan coverage and the recommendations and alerts from that. It's going to help me improve that posture that we want to improve. Just looking at that secure score, I gain instant insight to the security for my cloud workloads. It's going to help me address vulnerabilities with prioritized recommendations. It's going to list them out in the order of priority that you need to fix them. We're looking at improving that score. The higher the score, the better. And we can do that in a matter of minutes. It's going to speed up your regulatory compliance. Why? Because I can see what it's telling me in a policy that I'm deficient on. It is granular control. 
we're going to see access, compute, SQL servers, networks, apps, all of that, and what we can do to improve that score. Now, Defender for Cloud Secure Score. So again, looking at it specifically, seeing where we are at on our secure score. How many completed controls? One of 16. How many recommendations have been completed? 24 of 110. And I can drill into that. I can see all of my subscriptions, which ones are doing the best, which ones are doing the worst. But again, we're trying to get this to at least 70%. You're never going to get to 100%. That's really not going to happen because everything's always changing. We're adding, deleting, changing things, policies, all of that. But ideally, we want to get to 80%. But we can see all of our subscriptions, see that secure score. How are we stacked up? What do we need to do to improve? We can see all of our controls. We can see the recommendations by clicking the recommendations button to remediate those vulnerabilities. Now, some of these might just because you haven't, you've done the patches, but you haven't rebooted, right? Showing 56 of 59 resources need to remediate vulnerabilities but it might be a simple thing as you just need to reboot your box. But this is going to increase your score by 10% by fixing that. And that's where we wanna be. You can see your unhealthy resources, your healthy resources, not applicable. Again, compliance and assessment, again, Compliance status, we want to continually assess, come into compliance with those policies that we've applied to the environment. We want to monitor if we have multiple cloud environments. I don't want to have to go to all the cloud environments to look at each one individually. So I can use ARC to bring them in for multi-cloud and you'll see how many resources are in each of those. We're going to have a security benchmark. That policy, every subscription gets what's called the ASC default policy. That policy is based on NIST 853 with some Microsoft sprinkles thrown in for best practices on securing Azure. It's not the full NIST standard, but it's a good starting point. But again, you can see there are other policies I could apply. Most of the well-known supported standards are already in here, that all you have to do is choose to put that policy on there. So you can see my regulatory compliance. I can see where I stack up. So under identity management, we can see manage application identities securely and automatically, right? So where am I deficient? So you can see here, managed identity should be used in your web app. So rather than using something else, I want to manage my identities and apply that to those web applications. There are four resources that fail. And we can go through all of these ones that are not in compliance and fix those. Open it up, read it. What do you need to do? In this case, I need to create a managed identity for these web apps. But you can see here, privileged access, hey, we're all compliant, we're all good. Again, as I mentioned, that security benchmark policy, think of it as a starting point. Start there, secure that policy, get that one as far down the road as you can create exemptions, create remediation tasks, all of that to secure that one before moving on to another one. This, by doing that methodology that I just spoke of, when you apply, let's say NIST 853, whatever you fixed in this one would most likely take care of a lot of the findings in this one. 
so that you're not reworking it twice. Now, granted, if you applied exemptions, then you would have to apply those exemptions to this policy as well. But again, it's a great starting point. You have all sorts of pre-configured policies that you can apply to your environment. But if you layer 10 policies on top of each other from the very beginning, how do you know where you're at? How do you know you've done what you need to do? Because you're going to be working all 10 of those policies. I always say work one at a time, then layer another one on top. Your firewall manager. So if you've got firewalls running, whether they be Azure firewalls or supported third party vendor firewalls, you're going to see how they look. The virtual hub coverage. You can see what's covered, what's not covered, what's protected by the Azure firewall, a partner. Again, has to be an identified partner for it to see that. Virtual network security coverage, your VNets. What's covered for distributed denial of service, right? So we have the regular one, which is the fabric. And are you using the standard to protect your environment specifically? Looking at inventory, identifying all your devices, looking at all the systems that are being monitored so that you can filter, cross-reference, sort. I can even export in Azure Graph to a CSV, so I can see all of those. All my managed resources in a single view. So I can look at my inventory. Defender for Cloud periodically analyzes the security state of your Azure resources to identify potential security vulnerabilities. It then provides you recommendations on how to remediate those vulnerabilities. When any resource has an outstanding recommendation, they'll appear in that inventory. So things like total resources, how many are connected to security center, the unhealthy, active, recommendations that you need to look at unmonitored they don't have the monitoring agent or the agent is having issues the log analytic agent that you would deploy unregistered subscriptions so i can see a subscription that hasn't been registered to security center yet which is important but you can see here all the different things I can see my total resources, unhealthy, unmonitored, and unregistered. So we're good in these two, but we do have 318 unhealthy resources. I can filter by anything and everything. And then you can see, add non-Azure, download the CSV. So I can have this in CSV and work it. What are the things we're looking at? Where are the things installed for the monitoring agent or not installed is defender for cloud on all of that in a single view here's just a demonstration of how to filter so i'm looking for production systems right and i can specifically pull out that data it's got the monitoring agent looking at it what's not installed on the monitoring agent with a tag of production so we see all these right here, and now we're going to tag it, right? Based on a specific tag. Utilizing tags can be very valuable in your environment. And these are the things we want to look at when we're looking at Defender for Cloud. Looking at an overview for information protection, we can simply drill into the dashboard. This requires, again, having Azure Purview turned on but I can discover all of the resources, looking at all the information that it generates. How many credit card numbers did we see? Social security numbers, licenses, all of that. You can see here, it identifies what each of these is. You can see this is, these two are endpoints. This is a file repository. 
What's the risk to the device? In this case, there's a medium risk, 28 labeled files. So I can discover the data that could possibly get leaked in my environment and what that data is. Again, I mentioned you can fix directly from Defender for Cloud. There is a lightning bolt that is a quick fix option so that you really don't even know, you don't have to know what you're doing. Now, again, as I said, I'd read it before I fixed it so at least I could understand what was happening. There are some things I may not want to fix without talking to somebody else. There might be a, an application that it's telling me to fix, to enforce something on. But if I do that, it might break the application. How do I know that? Well, nothing happens in a vacuum, right? Go talk to the people who own the application. Hey, look, we're coming up with a security finding here and it wants me to fix it. Is it okay to fix it, right? But a lot of them aren't gonna have this. So what do I have to do? I have to read. I have to read the recommendation to remediate it. Follow the instructions, right? And again, once you do the fix, it's going to not be a recommendation anymore because it will now be identified as fix. Now, it's going to take time. It can take up to 24 hours for that to actually show up as being fixed. It's not going to happen instantaneously. But you can see all of these under actions have lightning bolts, which means I have a quick fix option. Some of these don't. We're looking, you know, probably about a 50-50 split here. But it's going to tell me for the ones that don't have quick fix. So in this case, you see management port should be closed. Okay, I could click on that. And it would tell me what to do. What do I need to do? Virtual machines should be protected with network security groups. Well, I can pretty much figure out that, oh, I probably have a virtual machine that's not behind a network security group. So I need to go fix that or talk to the person who can fix it. Again, that quick fix button, simply click on it, choose the resources that you want to remediate and tell it to remediate them. Again, I have all of the steps here it even tells me if I want to do it manually, what do I need to do? In your storage account, go to the configuration page, enable secure transfer. Or I simply click quick fix and it'll do it for me. So now everything's going to be securely transferred to that storage account. To and from. Again, multi-cloud environments. Azure Arc is an agent you have for servers, Kubernetes, data services, but this agent is free to use so that you can actually deploy this agent. If you're using it in conjunction with Defender for Cloud, you can actually enforce all those policies that Defender for Cloud is enforcing on all these Azure enabled resources. It's just that simple. All I would have to do is go to on-prem AWS, Google Cloud. I go into Azure, I generate a script and I tell it, I'm gonna use this script and I'm gonna deploy Azure Arc. I could do it in bulk, I can do it individually, however you want to do it. But then these ARC enabled systems are going to appear in Azure as if they existed in Azure. So now I can see secure score for them. I can enforce Defender for Cloud policies regulatory compliance, I'll get recommendations. My servers will be protected with Defender for Cloud. 
I'll have automation and management at scale in a single pane of glass, rather than having to bounce around to every individual resource and see what's going on. So again, like I said, I can see all those resources here as well. They're all going to appear, even though they're segregated by AWS, GCP, they're not gonna do it by on-prem. But I can see my multi-cloud, how many systems do I have in each cloud that are actually being managed, in a sense, by Defender for Cloud. I can see all of those. And I can enforce my policy, which I want to enforce for consistency across every environment. Everybody will abide by the same policy. There's no guessing game, right? Oh, did I do this? Did I do that? Oh, wait, let me go back and check. Because the minute I do ARC and Defender for Cloud, it's going to apply all of the same policy in a single ecosystem. Now, all of this integration right here in a Defender for 365, Defender for Cloud. This is your XDR, right? It's truly extended detection and response. We're looking at everything. Identity, apps, containers, storage, keys. And Microsoft also has Sentinel. Sentinel can be used as the SIM source solution. Not only does it ingest all of its own ecosystem, you can actually ingest third-party, multi-cloud environment, send those logs over. In here, I can actually create automation, SOAR, security orchestration and automated response. I can create all of my own custom correlation rules. So I can look for what's important to me based on a business requirement. Doesn't have to be an alert from here. I could look for event ABC and generate an event and say, yep, that's what I want to see. Nobody's supposed to be doing that. So let's go slap Mark upside the back of the head because he wasn't supposed to do that and warn him not to do that again. These are things that we can do with a SIM. We can create detection rules, but it's much easier to do it here with that correlation, protecting through an integrated environment. Now, all the things Defender for Cloud across Azure and your hybrid that it'll protect. Any server, any VM, containers, app services, databases, all these different databases, the Internet of Things, files, storage accounts, your Azure management you can actually apply Defender for Cloud to the management interface of Azure so that you can actually say, hmm, that doesn't look right. I don't think that VM's right. Block it. It's a threat. DNS. So I can see DNS, my Azure DNS, and detect threats from a DNS perspective. Layer one of the network level. But the big one I like to point out here is Key Vault. What protects your Key Vault? If you are using Key Vault, I don't know of any third party product that can protect the Key Vault. And if I'm a bad guy, if I can get the Key Vault, I own you because I own all your keys. What's going to protect my storage account? All the information that I'm storing in Azure, blobs, all of that in storage accounts. What protects this? I don't know of a third party application that protects this. Except Defender for Cloud. It exists in Azure. But these two are critical. We want to make sure that we prevent that. Sure, could I get could I get a different third party AV to do a server or a VM? Yeah, I could deploy that but I can't deploy a third party AV threat, whatever detection module to a key vault. I can't deploy it to a storage account. 
There's nowhere for it to exist. It has to be monitored in the cloud. How are you going to do that? That's Defender for Cloud. This single ecosystem that we're going to use with Defender for Cloud. Looking at my workload protections, right? Seeing how everything is working, all the resource coverage. I can drill into that. So I can see all my servers, containers, the container registries, apps, resource manager, my storage accounts, my key vaults. In this case, there are 78 key vaults, 74 of them with issues. Vulnerability assessment, 147 servers unprotected. Just-in-time access, 15 unprotected. Adaptive controls, network app or application controls, 48. My containers, scans, eight unprotected. I get all of this in a single view. I can see all my security alerts, everything that's happening, my insights, most attacked resources. I might want to look at these. Why are they trying to attack this so often? These two resources, right? Over 2,000, the next closest is this one at 223. Why are these two so important to the bad guys? Is it a false positive? I don't know, I have to go look. But it's prioritized. I get my incidents, my threats, all of that in a single view by drilling into a panel. Defender for servers protects Linux and Windows. So it's not just a Windows thing. I can apply Defender for Cloud, Defender for Servers to Windows and Linux boxes. I'll have the ability to reduce open ports with just-in-time VM access, limit the number of open ports with adaptive network hardening. I can block malware. Protect servers and clients, right? With Defender for Endpoint and Linux servers. Again, what's allowed, what's not? Behavioral analytics, what are they doing? It's going to look at the behavior. What's normal, what's not? Looking for malicious code and data exfiltration. That's what we want, and we want to do it across the world not just in the cloud. I want to see my on-prem, my other cloud environments. This is where it plays really well. In a, and it's all there. All you have to do is turn it on. You know, you get the option to turn it on for a 30-day trial. Why not test it out for 30 days? See the difference it's going to make. Again, turn on built-in vulnerability assessments for VMs for Defender for Servers. It's built in. Just turn it on. It's going to continuously scan and find vulnerabilities so that you can actually see the recommendation for fixing it. What CVE is it vulnerable to? Patch it. It's going to give me visibility to the findings in Security Center and APIs. Again, it's a Qualys scanner. It's not like it's just some made up quick little thing. It's a quality scanner. Qualys has been around a long time, has a great reputation. These are things that we're looking at, looking at all the security checks that it's going to run. What's the severity? How many devices did it apply to? What's the category? All of that's going to be right there for me to see when it detects vulnerabilities that need to be remediated. Again, I can see it all. SQL Server. If you're running SQL servers like most people are, I can see it across anywhere by using ARC. I could deploy it anywhere by using ARC, on-prem, other cloud environments, or just in Azure. It depends on how you're built, right? I mean, there are plenty of customers that are 100% in the cloud. Everything they own is in the cloud, except maybe, you know, workstations. Then I could use Defender for Endpoint. But again, I can see them all. All my SQL servers, no matter where they exist, 
Google Cloud, on-prem, in Azure, simply by deploying Azure Arc and Defender for SQL. It protects your containers, your storage. And again, I can't stress this enough. It protects containers, file shares, and data lakes. What else do you have? Do you have a third party that can actually look at a container and say, hey, look, somebody tried to exploit your container, your storage account? Probably not, but you enable it with a click. You deploy it. Hey, look, Defender for Cloud is telling me, you know, when I went in there to the settings that I have 14 storage accounts. Okay, enable it and it deploys. So I don't have to do anything else. Now I'm going to get, you know, an attacker tried to do something to my storage account, prevented him or them from doing it. It's all integrated. I can remediate it in a single step. If I have a SIM, whether it's Sentinel or not, I can send that alert. Continuously export the data to an event hub so that you can get it in a different SIM. But at least now I know my storage accounts are protected. Now they should use private links. There shouldn't be public access, but what if there is? And we haven't remediated that yet. We want to see if somebody tries to attack it. Container registries. It's seamless deployment and configuration. It's going to use dynamic analysis. It's going to scan these registries. And it's going to look for vulnerabilities, for threats inside those registries. It's going to look at all the images, give you visibility into what might be vulnerable in that container. Again, it's dynamic analysis when it runs. It's not static. It's actually looking and running it as one image, not pieces, so that you can see it all. And it can see what it's trying to do. By using dynamic analysis, it can see what it's trying to execute. Kubernetes, right? The de facto standard nowadays for containers. Gonna look at the cluster in the nodes. It's gonna help you harden these clusters. Security benchmark, right? I have policy. We can follow Docker CIS for container nodes. Runtime threat, right? So, hey, it runs. What did it do? Detect suspicious behavior. I, I don't think it was supposed to do that. Behavioral analysis. If it looks bad, smells bad, it must be bad. Maybe it's a false positive, but I would rather go down the rabbit hole for a false positive than not detect it at all. Admission control, policy management. Mandate audit security best practices for those workloads. Decide what you're going to do and how to enforce it. Looking at an attack matrix, I know you all can read, but just some of the things they do, the initial access using cloud credentials. Execute into the container. Put a back door in it. Privilege escalation. I could clear the container logs so you didn't see what I did. You might see I cleared the logs, but you don't know what I did to the container. List the secrets, access the API server, access cloud resources, destroy the data. Again, you don't know what they want to do, but you can see there are all sorts of methods, config files, modifying the paths, all of those things. Is there an SSH server in it, right? Brute force that. These are things that it looks at when you apply it to your containers. Again, it has a breadth of protection. Nothing else that I know of is going to protect the resource manager of Azure. Nothing else I know is going to protect 
my key vaults that I'm using in Azure. What if this were publicly accessible? And I see it a lot when I do assessments. That means somebody can access it. If they can see it, there's eventually going to be a way to break it. Defender for DNS. Monitor all your DNS. Send alerts of suspicious activity. DNS has a lot of exploits and it can also pick up a lot of bad places people are going. It could help me identify command and control. I'll see the requests. Where are you trying to get to? And it has built in threat intelligence to say, hey, you know what? That site's on a bad list for whatever reason. Defender for Internet of Things. I'll see all my assets. I can. Use vulnerability management, right? Threat detection, are there any identified threats it's seeing? And finally, if I'm using Sentinel or any other SIM, I can integrate it. So it gets pushed over so that I can correlate it with other related data streams to see how bad it really is. Or if I'm looking for a specific metric. Now, I'm not an accountant. These are just numbers to me. You know, I'm, I always tell people, yeah, I'm not the brightest bulb on the tree with all of these acronyms. And, you know, I mean, I understand numbers. Numbers don't lie. Math is the only exact science, right? Well, there was a study done. And I'm sure Gina would be happy to post that in there, please, in the chat for people to download. But, there was a study done of the economic impact for Azure Security Center. Yes, they renamed it to Defender for Cloud, but it is still a valuable study about the cost savings, okay? Return on investment, we're all familiar with that term, 219% by deploying Defender for Cloud or Azure Security Center, but benefits, PV, present value, 3.56 million. Net present value, 2.44 million. Payback, six months. So basically what I spent versus the benefit I gained versus how much I didn't spend all of that over the course of three years and all of, you know what? That's all numbers to me. Great, that's all accounting stuff. This is really what I'm interested in. This is what I understand. 25% reduction in risk of a breach. I'm all about that. If you can reduce my risk of a breach by 25%, I'm, I'm all on board with that. 50% reduction in time to threat mitigation. Great, that's awesome. Because now, I just saved 50% of my time that I go down the rabbit hole and investigate something because it's going to be remediated for me. 30% reduction in security policy and compliance management time. Awesome. So I'm not having to go through every policy page, figuring out all on my own. Okay, did I do this? Did I do that? Did I get that right? Did I apply it everywhere? No, I'm losing 30% of that manual work that I was doing. I'm all about that. Work smarter, not harder. And the other thing, $216,000 annual reduction on security tool spend. You know what? I'm all about this too, but my bosses are more about this. I saved them $216,000. Hopefully, I get to use this money for something else that I have a project for. Probably not, but that's what I'm looking at. These are the numbers I care about as a security guy. This, this is all accounting. You know, ROI, buzzword, return on investment, awesome. And it's true. 
we will get a return on investment. But these numbers from a security perspective, especially these three, are what I'm really interested in. That's where I really want to look. Again, I mentioned the fact that we look at all this information when we do an assessment. Talon is a Microsoft partner, and we do tons of assessments for customers looking through all of that architecture, identifying gaps, identifying places you might want to consider changing some of your methodology for securing it. We go through workshops. These workshops are all about you educating us and us educating you, right? It's a cooperative relationship. We want it to be a partnership, but we're going to evaluate all of these different things. We're going to talk about what third party stuff that you have in your environment. How is it working for you? Are those policies fully deployed, preventing what they should? And we come away with a pretty good picture of what you look like from a security perspective. We'll put all that into a proposal if you want us to help remediate it. If you don't, that's great too. Again, we're looking at, we do the assessment. We want to be your partner. We'll still be there if you have questions about our findings or how to do something. It's not, we're just going to come in and do it and then say, bye, see ya. No, we're still going to be there. Send us, you know, just remember we have day jobs. If you want us to answer a question, we all have day jobs doing stuff like this. Right? Okay. All right. I want to thank all of you for your time today. I know we're all busy and I appreciate you all coming here. If you have questions, please type them up in the chat and we'd be happy to answer those questions for you.